Welcome to Beyond the Block, a Web3 focused podcast where in each episode we'll explore a topic impacting our industry. Joined by an esteemed industry colleague, we'll dive deep into how it's driving our businesses. This is, of course, all powered by Kadena, the only truly scalable layer one proof of work blockchain. Let's dive in. Okay, we're on a new podcast series today for Beyond the Block, whereby we will discuss the topic of auditing security and trends within Web3. For intros, um, myself, John Frost, Solutions Engineer at Kadena. So I work across a number of areas, including our audits. Um, Others include integrations, looking at our grants and the technical uh, milestones there, product development, technical support, and a few other functions. And before this role, um, I was at a layer two protocol solution and uh, going back a tiny bit further, I was in uh, cybersecurity and in fintech. To that, I'll pass it over to our guest, Mikkel, for an introduction. Hey, John, thanks so much for having me and thank you to the uh, Kadena team. My name is Mikhail. I help to secure Web3 and uh, I do that through uh, CertiK, which is one of the largest Web3 security firms. So we specialize in all things Web3. That means uh, protecting chains, protecting wallets, exchanges, uh, decentralized applications, Uh, If it's anything related to blockchain, we pretty much play around with it. And uh, that's a little bit about myself. Awesome. Thank you. And for the agenda, I was thinking of putting this in three parts. um, And we'll provide timestamps for people to go to specific topics. But the reason I'm bringing this first topic up is because of a recent hack. I think this is exciting uh, because this is a topic um, Mikkel has been exposed to, um, this hack, and also we'll discuss some other uh, big hacks that have occurred within the uh, Web3 blockchain ecosystem. For a second topic, we'll look at trends outside of the norm and in what we're seeing. And I think we'll kind of sum things up on the kind of the third point there with like common common vulnerabilities, exploits, you know, the role of security audits. Um, and, you know, as we go through these, we'll provide examples within the ecosystem projects and, and essentially what they offer. But how about that, uh, Mikhail? We'll start things off with the recent hack. Um, the recent hack, uh, for those that don't know, happened, I believe, last month or, or, or this month. It's that recent um, with Audi ZK. Um, and, and Mikhail, uh, maybe I'll pass it to you in terms of giving us a little bit of context relating to this bridge attack, um, provide us some context on exactly what happened. Sure. Uh, so uh, Audi ZK, which they claim to be a private bridge that bridges from Ethereum to Bitcoin. I think they were even claiming to be able to bridge to Solana and Avalanche. Uh, They stole $1.4 million. Uh, It was the sixth exit scam of the year. And uh, I believe to date we're about at 64 million uh, in losses so far. So uh, basically what they did was the team announced a contract migration uh, to address a minor bug in their smart contract. So they were pat- going from a version one to a uh, version two. Uh, and so then the, what, what the deployer did is they sold massive amount of OZK tokens from both contracts. So essentially draining the liquidity. And then they drained the liquidity even more by withdrawing their ETH from an emergency withdrawal function. So, and this goes into a whole debate around centralization and having access to privileged functions, uh, where in this particular case, if uh, you know they didn't have the function to be able to withdraw their ETH, uh, you know, perhaps maybe not all of it, but some of that liquidity could have been restored. Um, and that centralization risk, just having access to these, um, privileged functions is one of the more common 
vulnerabilities uh, that we see uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. And it doesn't always mean that uh, that means that there is a uh, malicious intent there. But if you don't know who the team is, and if the, the team has uh, bad intentions, then you know they have access to be able to do whatever they want pretty much. And so this particular exit scam, I uh, believe was the uh, second largest, um, only second to Bit4X. So uh, that's this is uh, the most recent uh, exploit that occurred. Yeah, it's interesting to see like what happens in these exploits um, in terms of just the different you know ones that have also occurred in the in the past as well. Like I know Wormhole was in Feb. 22 um and curious did you have um you know on the topic of bridges did you have um insights into that one as well and if you could provide context yeah and you know from what i understand uh wormhole has long kind of moved past that they're now focused on their airdrop that they recently had around their new token uh so the Security, I'm sure, is a is a strong focal point for them. But in terms of this particular exploit, this was back in 2022. Uh, but it was a large amount. It was $320 million, uh, where basically there was a um, verification, signature verification function issue uh, with, uh, with their bridge. And so that the hacker was able to bypass the uh, verification function and uh, sent a malicious message to mint 120,000 wrapped ETH. Then the majority of that ETH was uh, bridged over to Ethereum, but mm. the stolen funds remained on the, the hacker's wallet. So uh, the, after that, as you can imagine, when it comes to auditing bridges, that's one of the main things that you want to make sure is in place which is that function for uh, signature verification. So in a nutshell, that's basically what happened. Um, but with bridges as a whole, you've got a lot of uh, things happening there from a technical perspective. So it, that's why they uh, become a very big target uh, when it comes to exploits. And we saw that in 2023 and 2022. Uh, because they also lock up so much liquidity there um, that they always end up being uh, a big target for a lot of the uh, hackers. Yeah, it's uh, interesting to hear, you know, what happens uh, within this area as a whole. Like, you know, that's just the topic of, of bridges. Like, I know there's been other, like, notable uh, exploits with, like, DAO attack. Uh, I think that was way further back in 2016. And I think that was the poly network, um, a little bit more recent in, in 2021. But um, yeah, I think we learn a lot from these different attacks. And I'm sure like, you know, different auditors also like learn uh, from them, and what can be done and achieved there. Um, because no one wants to be uh, hacked. On that kind of like looking at zooming out a little bit here like on the topic of maybe like trends and kind of like um like what are you seeing within the space as of today if it's learning from these hacks if it's in the past or like learning about new innovations that are occurring in the space within maybe it's ai or something like that um what are you seeing you know from speaking to the community speaking to the partners going to conferences and so forth. Like what, essentially what's, what's happening, what's hot? Sure, and uh, I'll preface by saying that these are my personal opinions because <laughs> as you mentioned, I'm, I'm the one out and about talking uh, to a lot of these projects. I love talking to, uh, you know, my community members. I have my own community that I, that I started. And so I, I talked to a lot of the founders and uh, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of things that happen in the traditional world that trickle into Web3. So for instance, you mentioned AI. There's a lot of conversation around NVIDIA and OpenAI and just everything that's happening on that front. 
Well, there are a lot of folks that are trying to front run that narrative in crypto, and they're looking at decentralized AI. And there's a few reasons why they're doing that. Uh, one is because the government wants to be able to regulate AI. And whether you're pro regulation or anti, there's going to be people that are on both sides of that front. The second reason is that many believe that with AI, you tend to uh, minimize job opportunities because you can do a lot more. And with decentralized AI, you essentially create an economy. Uh, and so those that are pro decentralized AI believe that it's the better option for that reason. And so in order for that to work, you need the proper infrastructure. So that leads me to believe that decentralized physical infrastructure networks are also a big narrative for that reason, because in order for AI to work, you need the right type of infrastructure to be able to run that specific AI model. And so whether it be time sensory or um, text or image, you need specific infrastructure to be able to handle those things. And uh, that's where the whole deep end narrative comes in. And that's why uh, looking at some of the projects out there, there've been a lot of traction around those two areas. So for me personally, that's one area that has been really interesting to me to explore and to continue to learn about. And I imagine that with new innovation will come new vulnerabilities. And so there's gonna be new things to learn about from a security perspective. 100%. And, you know, you, I was thinking on, on this topic as well, like the advancements um, in, in a few areas. And one that came to mind was the smart contract security. You know, as it expands, as it grows, this also means, as you were kind of hinting, like more exploits within them. Um, you know, I definitely do see like a need for like sophisticated tools um, and practices for the auditing side of things um, of the, the smart contracts, like formal verifications and other security principles um, on that front. And, you know, I think some of the other things that I've seen from being at conferences and the community is um, one that comes up is the uh, zero knowledge proofs, uh, but like for the verification um, of transactions and data. Um, without like revealing the underlying uh, information um, is great for privacy and security. And then also the other kind of topic that, that comes to mind, um, which opens up another can of worms is the quantum computing, uh, you know, quantum computing, um, you know, attacks, um, like what does that mean for like, uh, you know, post quorum, you know, cryptographic, um, algorithms and uh, security within the auditing space. Um, but I think as that progresses and as that grows, uh, as we've seen in the past with different auditing and security firms that, you know, that, you know, they'll learn from that and, you know, build the different uh, algorithms and, and so forth to like handle those particular situations. But they're the three areas that I was just kind of thinking of the, the, the top of my head and what I've kind of seen being brought up when I go to these these conferences um, and speaking to the community, I love going to the conferences because I feel like you are like kind of ahead of time. You're seeing what the community is working on, or thinking about, or discussing. So I always feel like these particular events are very helpful in understanding um, what is you know trending, what is hot from that side of things. Um, but yeah, those are just some of my thoughts there on that. On the, on that kind of evolving from this, and I, I said this is the third kind of point of our discussion is more on the, you know, vulnerabilities, the exploits, the role of security auditors. Um, like, I guess my question to you here is like, what is the role of like a security audit in blockchain and i ask this more for the kind of understanding the fundamentals of like hey i've got a, a dap like i'm new to the the you know security auditing space like what what is the benefit of doing an, an audit and we've kind of highlighted on some of these things already but yeah from 
I feel like this is a common question that you would get regularly. So I'd love to learn from you and the questions that you get asked in that, that area. Yeah. So if I was to put my uh, founder hat on, so to speak, and if I have smart contracts that are going to be handling large amounts of, of assets, I want to be able to sleep at night. And I keep hearing about all of these vulnerabilities that pop up and exploits and it, it doesn't necessarily sound very, uh, in, you know, inviting to be able to build uh, in this space when I have to worry about these types of exploits. So the very first thing that I would say is uh, for the founders out there is, uh, you know, a an audit allows for you to be able to sleep at night. Now, you have to do a proper audit. So I'll, I'll, I'll preface by saying that uh, because there, there are some teams out there that try to skip out on having a proper audit. And what do I mean by that? Well, some people just use an audit as a way to be able to market their project. So you definitely don't want to do that because if you audit only a portion of your application, there are still other vulnerabilities, right? And, and I would even go as far as to say is if you have audited all of your smart contracts, a hacker can find multiple ways of being able to find an exploit. They don't just go through the smart contract. They can go through the actual code base around your smart contract, through the mm -hmm. front end, through the back end. There's a lot of different entrances, you know, ways to enter and have the exploit. So there's a lot of factors that go into play here, of course. Um, mm -hmm. Part of that is what, what's your budget? I mean, what kind of finances are you working with? But if you have the resources, why not get the full audit from top to bottom? Now, what does that look like? Well, it, it would start with a smart contract audit because that is the core of what makes it Web3. Yeah. But outside of that, you may want to work on doing what's called a penetration test, uh, which focuses on the code base that is a little bit more traditional, right? It, it's, it could be just the, the, the front end of your application, or as I mentioned, the back end. Uh, however, there's a lot of information that is being passed from the API, for instance, into the smart contract. So you want to make sure that both of those are safe, right? So you want to start by doing a proper audit and a penetration test. And then once you have that done, it really depends on what your priorities are. Are you looking to instill confidence in your community? If so, you could do something like a KYC, where your information isn't necessarily disclosed to the community, but you are verified by a trusted source. So that's one thing that you can do. Another thing that's very common is a uh, having a bug bounty in place. And what that allows for is just the ongoing, uh, just challenging your code base, just making sure that you're always up to date on the vulnerabilities. So bug bounties, the way that works is you have a community of white hat hackers they try to find exploits and then they essentially are rewarded the main thing with that is you want to make sure you provide proper rewards because if you don't then some of those gray hackers may turn into black hat hackers right so you want to make sure you have the proper rewards and there's a lot of different options for that you know certi k is one of them of course but uh, that's something that I highly recommend if you truly take your security seriously and there are other options as well, but uh, I'll, I'll pause there. No, I think you bring up some great points, especially with, you know, the penetration tests. And I was going to dive deeper into that in terms of like, I'm not sure if um, that's revealing your secret source there, but, you know, I'd love to understand more on the, the penetration tests and the KYC of things, like looking back at my experience, I think that comes into play, but it also has an effect on potentially adoption. Um, you know, you don't want to add friction if it's not needed uh, from that side of things. So KYC is definitely required for certain, maybe administration or certain roles, but also I've seen it the other effect where, you know, KYC might hinder uh, adoption uh, for certain products or features that, that are released. Um, your, your, point on bug bounty could not agree more. Um, I think that is like for those that 
uh, I'm familiar with that. It's, it's think of it as a continual audit from the community um, where there are rewards based upon the severity of the exploit um, that the white hatter has found. Um, you know, I think they are fantastic to grow the community and get them more involved. And, you know, a lot of the, the community want, you know, the different protocols to flourish and succeed. And, you know, we need them to kind of report on these uh, specific bugs that sometimes get missed. And, you know, that's why you obviously have the bug bounty, you have the audit. And the other thing I was going to recommend is if you do have certain trusted, you know, potential community members, you can also um, work with them in terms of, you know, going through the code, very similar to the bug bounty program um, to understand like what, um, how is the UX, how is the flow? Does this make sense? Um, was there friction here? Where can, where can this come along? Um, and sometimes, uh, Mikhail, or correct me if I'm wrong, the, it, it makes sense to do multiple audits because products and products change, products evolve um, uh, from that front. So, you know, it might make sense if it is like what we've been talking about before um, with the recent hacks of bridge, maybe it makes sense to look at that another one further down the road, you know, in nine months or six months or 12 months down the road um, because things evolve. You need these different penetration tests um, and, and, and so forth. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I would even say that uh, before approaching a security auditor, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you could do now using chat GPT, for instance, uh, you could run your code base through that if it's something simple, of course, you know, if it's something that ex is extremely technically savvy, probably not the best option that, you know, don't use chat GPT to audit your smart contracts. But, uh, you know, if just as an initial look, over before yeah. you provide it to an auditor. I think that's a great way for you to uh, just make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, right? Because it, the, the better your code base looks up front, when you provide it to the, the auditor for a quotation, you know, they'll be able to tell you how many days that they need in order to scope that out. And if you have good quality code base, it's not going to require as much time, which therefore means it's not going to require as much resources for you. So a shorter timeline, you know, smaller budget, which ultimately will help the project. Yeah. Yeah. I think like Copilot uh, as well, helping with like testing and giving recommendations. And, and I think you're touching on a point that I did want to kind of bring up, like there are a lot of new like dApps that are going that their budget, you know, might be at a stage where they're, you know, relatively new, they might be actively fun, you know, fundraising. What other maybe thoughts can help on the process um, with the auditing uh, side of things? Are there similar like AI tools available that, that you're familiar with. Um, I think, you know, the, the co-pilot's definitely like one of them. Um, but are there other things that maybe I haven't been thinking of or considering that, you know, small adapts could potentially utilize that would help them? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know of any specific uh, applications, although I think there are uh, plenty, you just need to do your research. I will say that a lot of auditors also have checklists. So you could ask uh, an auditor, hey, I've got this specific type of application I'm building, or let's say you're building a wallet. Uh, do you happen to have a checklist for what you're going to be looking for? So you could be proactive and ask an auditor that type of question. Just because you're engaging with an auditor, that doesn't mean there's like an obligation for you to actually go through with an audit. Mm -hmm. So you can gather that information, make sure that you're prepared. So that way, you know, up front, okay, I checked off all these boxes. I think this is the best version of this application. I'm ready to submit it to uh, an auditor for a quotation. Uh, yeah, that's that's solid feedback there, uh, suggestion. So that does that also include things like, hey, like what are you guys doing for like the penetration tests? Um, just kind of understanding the, the scope of, because I feel like auditors are, you know, some of them are specialized in certain fields, some are, are more broad, you know, depending upon the size of the auditor. 
but um, you know some maybe you know focusing on a particular vertical that might make sense to them and it might make sense to actually speak to them specifically on like hey we're doing this dap i see you've done something similar with another dap like what is the checklist here what type of penetration tests you're doing so like getting getting input from a auditor that has been down that road before and understands the scope and what makes sense there might be another thought on that process yeah, I think you kind of touched on the importance of making sure that you're dealing with an auditor that ha has, you know, specialty in a specific area. And with certain security firms, like for instance, with CertiK, you could go to our leaderboard and you can look at all the projects that we have audited. So we're very transparent about who we have worked with. You can look at the audit reports. Everything is, you know, out front and center. Uh, if it's anything open source related. Right. Um, and so you can even categorize it based on DeFi, based on GameFi, whatever the type of project you have, you can categorize it and see what other projects that may be similar to yours that uh, CertiK has audited before. And I think some other auditing firms do that as well. Uh, and even if they don't, I mean, I'm sure that you could always ask for a, you know, some type of a testimonial. Uh, if they don't have any anything that they can offer you, uh, I would say that's probably a red flag. I may may avoid uh, working with them, but uh, just because it's not public doesn't mean that they haven't actually done any kind of work with them. But some firms, you don't even need to approach them. You could just go to the leaderboard or go to their website and you should be able to have access to that information. So yeah, making sure the auditing firm has the reputation in that specific field, I think is also very important. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for highlighting that. And I mean, there's challenges are different for everyone um, in this space. And I can't emphasize how important it is to get a reputable um, auditing uh, firm to like collaborate with and work with. Um, you want someone that, you know, from my experience that you have great communication, you're open, transparent, There's those topics that you discussed, you know, what are the penetration tests you're doing? What type of um, checklist uh, do you guys look at is exactly what you want um, to hear. So, you know, I, I leave that to the the community and the, and the projects they're working on to, you know, decide who they're working with, but you can definitely see the projects in the past that these auditors have worked with. So I think, you know, that kind of wraps up, um, you know, the three part topics that Mikel and I were discussing. And I think as a last point, um, Mikel, I, there's, you know, we touched on things more from like a high level, some, some technical aspects, um, but there's so much more information. So like, how can people get in, in like details from you and touch with you? And maybe we'll also include that in the, the, the release notes um, as we go ahead, but yeah, how can people uh, get in touch with you if they have some, some further questions? Absolutely. Uh, so they can go to certik.com and they can fill out a sign up form and a representative will be in touch with them. If they want to get in touch with me directly, uh, that's great as well. Uh, I'd be happy to assist them. They can get in contact with me on X, formerly Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, I'm happy to leave my email address if that works best as well. So uh, even Telegram. So I'm constantly uh, connected to uh, to the digital world. So uh, that's those are the best ways to to get in contact with me. Fantastic. And is there anywhere people can meet you in person? Are you have you got any upcoming conferences or, or any talks that people can can see or be part of? Yeah, I, I'm working on that part. Uh, I think the next one that I'm going to attend is going to be Consensus in Austin. Uh, that one's pretty big usually. Uh, so that's probably the next one on my list. Yeah. Are you going to be at that one? Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna definitely try to make it down to that one. I haven't had confirmation yet, but I think that's a great event to attend um, from past, you know, past experiences and just hearing what people have said before. So I think that's a good one to, to go to and if there's auditing tracks, um, security tracks, I highly recommend to go to those um, because they're always interesting. But Mikel, thank you for the time. And that concludes the podcast. Thanks. 
thank you, John, and thank you to uh, the Cadena team. It's always a pleasure to connect. Likewise. Cheers. Cheers.